Good morning, dear students, and welcome to our course on Neoplatonism. It's my pleasure to welcome you all. Unfortunately, I will not know how many of us are in this course, um, and I will need to check that out. But if we don't mind, please, uh, when you come online, just indicate so that it will also help me to know who is there. And then I will be able to, uh, <clears throat> it would help me as I'm sharing out your topics to know how many topics I have to come up with for our presentations. So once more, you're welcome to the course. And I know all of you are students of, uh, past students of philosophy or at least. So the concept of Neoplatonism is not going to be something very unfamiliar to you. Uh, I guess that what we are doing in this uh, top-up course is not so much to learn the new things. There may be areas of very little that we may know, we get to learn which is new to us, but largely what, what, what we are going to be doing are kind of uh, repetitions. We will say repetition is a mode of learning. So we'll just basically be reminding ourselves of some of the things that we have we have done before already, maybe in more detailed form or in less detailed form con con compared to what we did in, in the past. And so if we if in the course of the lessons there are areas you feel maybe we would have dwelled uh, more on in, in detail, in greater detail, please always endeavor to call our attention to it so that we do not... Uh, disadvantage you by taking for granted that there are a number of things that you ought to have known so we can always uh, revisit our concepts and it's basically going to be a discussion and that's why i said um although i'm going to be sending in the voice notes i would really prefer an interactive environment it's going to be the first time i'm using voice notes to teach so that's why i had to ask whether you which method you prefer you, you prefer with the last time I had to teach this course, uh, we were using uh, Zoom classes, so you could actually even see see persons, and then the interaction was live, uh, so it, it made it even uh, easier to 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 e to easily engage in direct uh, conversations with, with with the students, so much so that um, a student wouldn't have to come to wait to listen to the voice notes before sending you feedback and all of that. But it's good. It's good. Um, we are going to go by the method which we, we you have been using, which is the, the voice notes. I think the variety in, in in the method of doing things is equally something uh, something cherishable. So I welcome you once again, and I I wish you a fruitful time in this course. Um, I think we have about twenty hours allocated for this course. We are definitely not going to have twenty hours of lectures. That wouldn't be possible. We are going to introduce the course. Once we introduce the course with the with fundamental concepts and discussions, then we shall we shall go back as you usually would do to do your 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 your, your papers and then maybe then we can come back and share our our knowledge on the on, on the various topics that we that we have done and then we have a, a, a close a closing assessment for for the course. That is basically how simple it shall be. But like I said, you are always free to get back to me, even at a personal level, if you find any challenges in the course of your reading, as far as this course is concerned. My name is Ngoran Matthew Banlanjo. For those who do not know me, that is my name, and I will be your facilitator in this course. Now, to take you into the concept of Neoplatonism itself, Neoplatonism is a concept we must have heard, especially in our study of classical Greek philosophy, because this is the context within which this usage is most proper. It is um, a compound term, Neo and Platonism. Of course, when we talk about Platonism, we, we know we are referring to the philosophical corpus of uh, Plato. Um, Plato did a lot in terms of philosophy. He wrote on various subjects, from cosmology to metaphysics to ethics to epistemology, anthropology, politics, and what have you, arts, and all of that. And after Plato, there have been several interpretations by different schools and traditions of philosophy uh, of, of what Plato's system was all about. And among these uh, unique interpretations that arose is 
what has come to be known today as Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism, a kind of a, a new way of looking at Plato and Plato's system, a, a new way of presenting Plato's philosophical system. Neoplatonism is the modern name which has been given to the form of Platonism which was developed by Plotinus uh, in the third century before the common era and modified later on of course by his successors. So, like I said several persons have attempted if you look at even in the Christian tradition of philosophy you're going to find that there are uh, Christian writers you take for example Saint Augustine of Hippo, you take also um, uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa and all of that they, they, who, who developed a certain philosophy based on the ideas of, of, of Plato and so we find a lot of Platonic ideas intimated in the writings of various uh, uh, philosophers of the later period, that is post-Plato. And among them, among these various shades of interpretation, there is one which has distinguished itself across time. It is the interpretation of Plato's thought according to Plotinus. And uh, it's it's... Plotinus is, we may consider Plotinus as the maybe the close of the classical Greek period of philosophy, the Hellenistic period of philosophy. Because after Plotinus, then we get into, eventually we, we get to transition from ancient philosophy into, into, into the medieval period of philosophy, into the scholastic period of philosophy. And so this transition is influenced a lot by the 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 kind of uh, interpretation which Plotinus gives to Platonism, which we are going to be seeing, a philosophy which is, I mean, a system of philosophy which is both um, idealistic but also, in a sense, mystical in in its in its approach. So we are going to begin, therefore, by clarifying the concept of uh, of Neoplatonism. And then we look at the structure of Neoplatonism. What did it actually, what was it all about? What was its focus? What did it try to clarify? What were its fundamental questions and assumptions? And, and, and we look at how those, how, those, uh, how those structures were developed within the framework of, of uh, Plotinus' uh, writings, fundamentally his Aeneas. So as we have already mentioned, the term Neoplatonism simply refers to the present day, it is, it is the modern form or the, sort of the modern name which has been given to Plotinus' interpretation of, of Plato in the third century uh, of the common era. And it is, a, it is the form of philosophy which came to dominate most of the Greek philosophizing in the period beyond Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. It became the most dominant school of, of, of philosophizing. And uh, in fact, we can also call it the, um, the, 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 last, the last philosophical school of the Greek era of philosophy, you know, because uh, it, it is considered that pagan Greek philosophy ended with, with Plotinus and uh, with uh, Neoplatonism of Plotinus. So Neoplatonism could be considered as kind of closing in the door, closing the door in on, on, on ancient Greek philosophy and then making room for the transition to uh, medieval philosophy. In, in, in terms of its uh, content, fundamental content, Neoplatonism is not a homogeneous uh, philosophy not homogeneous in the sense that it, 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 Plato is the fundamental um, philosopher who is the focus of Neoplatonism, yes, but it borrows also from a number of other trains of thought, including Stoic uh, philosophy, including Aristotelianism. We are going to find elements of Aristotelianism in, in, uh, in Neoplatonism. We are going to find elements of Stoicism in Neoplatonism. And we are also going to find its religious character, its mystical side that Neoplatonism was in its very nature 
also mystically oriented. So that's why I said it's kind of uh, in philosophy, we'll talk about this borrowing from different uh, angles to build a, a unique system. We'll call it eclecticism, that um, uh, Neoplatonism was a kind of uh, eclectic approach to philosophy. It, it, it built on a combination of diverse beliefs. And so we could consider it eclectic or syncretic in, in, in its approach. You know. So some people tend to think that um, Neoplatonism also uh, borrowed a lot from um, ancient Judaism. And that, that is why it was very easy for it to appeal to later on Christianity. So that is that is the view some people hold. And of course, we are going to find that Christianity was heavily influenced by this Christianity in the first 1000 years of its existence was heavily influenced by Plato's philosophy. And therefore, any philosophy which was in a sense an elaboration of, of, of Plato's philosophy was definitely going to be of appeal. To, to Christian, to, 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 to Christian, to, to, to medieval philosophy, to Christianity and to scholasticism. And so that's why we find that um, in the first, maybe the first uh, half millennia of, 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 the, of the existence, of, or millennium of the existence of Christianity, maybe about the first 500 years of the existence of, of Christianity, the, the, the dominant philosophical school which sustained Christian theology was Platonism. And it was, of course, like I mentioned earlier, uh, given elaborate, you know, bab baptizing by people like uh, Augustine of Hippo and the rest. We we may we may in passing mention some of the heavily Platonic ideas contained in in in, in Saint Augustine's philosophy, including his doctrine of the seminal reasons, the rationis seminales, and some of those. Which which are a reflection of the cosmology, the, the metaphysical cosmology of of uh, of Plato. So this is to share is to just tell us that Neoplatonism is not a homogeneous idea. It is a, a a body of ideas which have been borrowed from various sources, but which all of them together are in a way trying to present and represent the the, the thoughts of 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 Plato. To contemporary man in, in now in, in maybe in our own time, but also con contemporary in the sense of or in the context of Plotinus, the people who we are contemporary to Plotinus, so trying to every to to, to make it uh, accessible, Plato's thought accessible to them by giving them an interpretation which they they think was more authentic than what people would have received. So before we proceed to elaborate more on Neoplatonism, I would want to ask us from what you, our, our previous studies on philosophy, especially the philosophy of Plato. Let us fall back a bit and do a, a kind of, of revision of the, of the Platonic system, which forms the basis of the Platonism, of the Neoplatonism of Plotinus. The first thing we will note about Plato is, uh, and Neoplatonism is that Neoplatonism takes over from the uh, metaphysical cosmology of Plato. And so it will be of interest for us to address the metaphysical concerns, the, the metaphysical cosmological concerns that arise from Plato and which Plotinus gives a unique elaboration to, sometimes even going well beyond what Plato himself had said. If we remember very well, for those who may have read Plato's cosmology very well and his metaphysics, Plato encountered a, a serious problem in philosophy, which had not been resolved for centuries by, uh, and pre by, by, by the previous uh, schools of philosophy before him. What was this major problem? On the one hand, we find that pre-Socratic philosophy, sorry, um, Ionian philosophy, came up with a vision of the world which was characterized by the principle of unity in diversity. 
that is to say there are so many types of things that exist the world is not one kind the world is made up of a plurality yet in the midst of this plurality there is a certain harmony that maintains the cosmic order this idea according to the the, 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 the ionians for example to say that there is diversity from a philosophical point of view is to admit is to adopt the idea that change is possible because it is through change that a thing can move from one state to another or something which was not can come to be and that which was can cease to be or can take on multiple forms of expressions that is according to the ionians but this idea of there being a plurality of beings existing coexisting in unity and this existence is made possible this plurality is made possible through the phenomenon of change was uh, radically rejected by uh, uh, parmenides and the whole of eleatic philosophy who rather thought of the universe as a single unit a single entity which lacks the property of change which the ionians held to be the defining characteristic of the cosmic order so for the for the eleatics there is no such thing as change the property that defines the universe is its changelessness and so being according to Plotinus, being simply is on uh, being simply is and becoming is impossible a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time as we used to say in the principle of non-contradiction Plotinus said um, that which is not cannot come to be that which is cannot already cannot become because it already is and so any only such perceptions of movement from 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 one state of being to another is already being and so does not you know can cannot be a, a, a described as a process of change so change is an illusion it's a deception of the senses you know and so for him uh, uh, it, it, it is it is it is this reliance on sense perception of the uh, by the ionians that led them to this supposedly false conclusions about there being a plurality in the world, there being a same unity in diversity, and there being change in the world. Well, that, that was that was the disagreement between the Ionians and the Eleatics. Now Plato comes to the scene and finds that this is this debate has not been resolved by his uh, his uh, his predecessors. Anaxagoras had tried his own idea of way of, of, of reconciling it. It didn't go with his idea of the, 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 the cosmic soul and all of that. It didn't work. And then you know, Pythagoras too came and, and all of that. Everybody made an effort to try to, 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 to solve this cosmic problem. And at one point, it looked like the problem was not the world as such but probably the the, the world was the, the problem was with the person who was studying the world and so eventually philosophy was shifting from the object to the subject but then when plato comes to the scene plato feels the urge to revisit this cosmological concern and i will bet you that from my own the way i have always looked at plato's contribution for me he, he what is of interest to me in his contribution is not so much that he brought the question back to the table but the manner in which plato re, uh, resolved the problem um you you, you can imagine uh, let me give you a certain analogy here you are a parent or you are an elder an adult and you come and you meet two children they are quarreling they are even fighting and you know very well these two children are very dear to you if you tell the first child that no you are wrong and this and the other one was right you kind of credit the other one you make the other one feel bad and you don't want a situation where one will feel bad and the other one will not feel bad because somehow you have listened to the two sides of the story and you realize that there is there is truth an element of truth in everybody's uh, version you know so so probably the pro the problem is not that uh, one is completely false and the other is completely right 
uh, the problem could rather be that each of them possesses a certain element of truth but they want to you know take their their portion of the truth they possess to stand for the whole truth this was the kind of situation plato found with uh, um ionian philosophy and with uh, Eliatic philosophy. And so in trying to reconcile this view, Plato gave both of them credibility. Plato said the Ionians were right, the Eliatics were right. And so in solving the problem, how does how does he how does he say that the Ionians were right and the, the Eliatics were right? He brings in the, the doctrine of the two worlds, which is of interest to our study of Plotinus, the, the dichotomization of the, the world of the senses from the world of forms, in which he makes the world of senses represent the Ionian perception of reality, and then of course the, the, the world of forms to, to, to represent the, the Eliatic perception of, of reality. Now, if you if you go to the study of Plato's world of forms, which is detailed, which, which is which has been given greater description in a number of his dialogues, especially he, in, in his in his Timaeus. Uh, if you have not read that dialogue, maybe sometime you could find time and, and, and read it, the Timaeus. The Timaeus is a dialogue in which Plato gives an, uh, an account of the creation of the world. And so if, in Plato's world of forms, Plato makes it in, in, in dichotomizing the world of forms and the world of the senses. Plato makes it in such a way that these two worlds don't have equivalence. The world of forms for Plato is the most perfect of worlds you could ever imagine, you could ever think of, you could ever have. The realities in this world possess the most excellent level of being. And because they also they possess the most excellent level of being, they also possess the most excellent level of truth. They are the most reliable, the most dependable in terms of our knowledge. And what are these realities? He calls them the forms. They are the originals of things. They are the prototypes. They are the archetypes of everything. Are the forms. The forms exist independently of our knowing them. They exist independently of our knowing them. They they are eternal, but I will, of course we will talk about the eternity. Eternity in metaphysics, we almost must make a distinction between uh, eternal beings and eternal beings. Eternal beings being those which have always been and will always be. Uh, if eternal beings are those which we are not always there, but from the moment they be, they come to be, they will always be. Most of the forms in Plato's description are what we may call eternal beings because they are created by the by the divine creator you know they, they, there is a divine creator and the, the the forms are the ideas of things which are found in the mind of the divine creator and the the the, the, the maker of of the of the material world the creator of the material world who is the demiurge who walks after after the pattern of these forms to set into place everything that we find in the material world so the forms are eternal, they are intelligible, meaning we can know them. They are the most excellent in terms of being. They are the most excellent in terms of truth. And we can, our knowledge of the forms is the most, is the most reliable and the most certain form of knowledge. It is knowledge which admits of the highest degree of certitude. Now, when Plato comes to the world of the senses, the senses are more, I mean, the world of the senses and everything that is found in it is a complete shadow of the world of forms. They are not real things, according to Plato. The, the, the world of the senses is not made up of real things, but more or less of, of, of shadows, you know. The things in the world of forms are, are transient, they are passing away, and passing away for Plato is a characteristic of something which is um, imperfect. So the material world is imperfect as compared to the, the, the world of forms. But then the material world is a mirror image. It's a reflection of everything in, of the world of forms because everything in the material world reflects something in the world of forms. Um, if, you, if you read the, the account of the creation of the world from the Timaeus, you, you, you're going to find in it how the, 
his description is a very elaborate description of how the damage the divine craftsman or how he or he calls it in other words the logos you know sets into motion the the the, the world of the senses i mean the the, the 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 material world of sense perception the the physical the, the, the human side of the material world is more or less into his anthropology but gives us another glimpse of what plato considers uh, uh, the human person to be the, the the human person according to plato is not as some philosophers would define it a union of body and soul no the human person is a soul imprisoned in a body the body is not an essential part of a human being of being human okay so the the, the the body belongs to the material world it is a kind of a trap for the soul and since the soul is a form the the the, the process by which the soul gets into the body is explained in terms of punishment for disobedience so the soul once was within the world of forms the soul disobeyed its creator and the soul was punished into the material world locked up in bodies and once it is in the body throughout the time it is in the body the soul is looking forward to its redemption to its release so that it could make its journey back to where it belongs to its world of forms to its maker and to contemplate the the the, the supreme creator who in, in plato's uh, in plato's philosophy we refer to as the form of the good that is the highest good that's why you find in the in the allegory of uh, the cave in plato's allegory of the cave him this this allegory explains all that i have said in terms of the distinction between the world of forms and the material world the the the, the world outside of the cave is um is uh, uh, in, in it's an, analog, an, an analogy of the real world you know where the form of the good shines on everything and because of this shining in quotes it gives every being in outside the cave its intelligibility its ability to be perceived to be known and then of course the world in the cave is a world of darkness which is of the what we're calling here the darkness of ignorance darkness of ignorance which is one of the explanations for why the soul is trapped in the body it is it, the, the body the, the body traps the soul in a form of ignorance and so for plato one way one, the, the way to liberation is through struggling to liberate oneself from ignorance and to contemplate the divine source from which one originates so when we get back to this we'll be falling back to these ideas of, of plato from time to time when we revisit plotinus and we're trying to we'll be trying to see how plotinus picks up from these ideas of plato and what new flesh or what interpretation he gives and what new dimension he uh, he he applies this uh, these ideas of play of plato to now I'm, I'm going to talk about fundamental tenets in platonism is sorry in in neoplatonism when we talk about a tenet what we mean are uh, distinctive threats in in a, a given school of thought and what we may also refer to as the themes or, or principles that define a given school of thought so we want to identify some of the key ideas key assumptions key beliefs within the the structure of Plat uh, plotinian neoplatonism the first like i say is the idea that there is plurality in levels of being according to plotinus being exists in plurality there are different kinds of beings and different kinds of beings also imply different levels of being because for plotinus nature understood as the world of existence is not a round table conference but a hierarchized order of existence so there is plurality of beings these beings are arranged or exist according to gradation in their levels of being and this uh, gradation is in order of hierarchy of course so we can imagine that taking from plato we would expect the most spiritual beings to occupy 
or the more the, the, the beings at the most at, at the spiritual levels to occupy the topmost levels of the hierarchy and material beings to occupy the lower levels of of the hierarchy precisely because of that fundamental belief which runs through all of platonism that the spiritual is more of being than the material the spiritual is more real more true than the material and so any being which is purely spiritual therefore takes precedence over that which is either material or composite of, of both spirit and and matter so first principle therefore for us in for us to note in, in neoplatonism is that is the belief that there is a plurality of beings there is a plurality in the levels of beings that is to say beings are arranged in a hierarchical order at the top of the being being of course the spiritual being and at the bottom the more physical aspects of of nature of course we are going to see that in plotinus uh, matter matter is matter is considered so low so low in terms of dignity in being in terms of reality in terms of um it's it, it, it's dependence i don't know whether to say dependence on in, in terms of um in terms of how um certainty that's the right word to use in terms of its certitude knowledge of matter is the least form of of, of the, the least certain form of knowledge and uh, because it exists in time in space it's subject to change and uh, it's based on sense perception which according to plato of course the senses do not give us reliable knowledge so according to plotinus also all of that anything that concerns matter therefore goes to the lowest levels of being the second thing to note about uh, platonism is that each level of being in platonism is derived from its superior each level is a progeny of the level that comes above or before it. In other words, there is a kind of, uh, we can say that if we were to employ biological language here, each level is the progenitor of the level that comes after it. Each level is a parent of the next level. It gives rise to it. It gives rise to it and so we expect of course that if you can give rise to something that which gives rise has more preeminence it has preeminence over the one which is given rise to and that which is given rise to has uh, less uh, eminence in respect to the one which gives it rise so that the, this is the principle which uh, Plotinus uh, espouses in his philosophy the principle of uh, generation and the generation here is it, it, it is both ultimate and proximate ultimate means everything comes if you want to trace the chain of origins everything comes ultimately from one source which he calls the one but then although everything comes ultimately from the one the proximate causes of things are not always the one the one gives rise to a certain other being that being gives rise to another one that other one gives rise to another until we come to the to the lowest levels of being so insofar as every being can trace their origin back to the one the one is not always the immediate originator of each level of being we, we, we are going to talk uh, make this uh, maybe very clearly when we when we begin to talk about the the doctrine of hypostasis in in in, in, in plotinus when we explain how the three has hypostasis, the the one, the intellect and the soul, how they originate and how they give rise to each other, the interdependence and interrelation between the three of them, then we understand from there how the how this chain of causality that of giving rise, the each level of being receiving its origin from the level previous to it and giving rise to the next level after it. The third point which we need to note about the structure of being of, of being in, in Plotinus is that each 
derived level i want to emphasize the word derived each derived level of being kind of kind kind of establishes itself in real it establishes its own reality right it, it, it kind of it is yes it is established in its own reality by always turning back towards the source from which it originates that is to say that um we 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 could say that in for in, uh, using this analogy of a mother and a and a baby, when the mother gives birth to the baby and the umbilical cord, the baby is is severed from the mother when the umbilical cord is cut. Some eventually the baby can live an independent life of them from the mother, and eventually just like also the egg and the fowl that hatches when the, uh, when the, uh, a fowl lays an egg and incubates the egg. From the moment it hatches and the the, 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 the the chick is capable of living an independent life, you know, it, it, it could eventually go away from the fowl. But Plotinus makes us understand something here, that for every level that is derived from another one, there is no possibility of having its reality severed from that source from which it is derived. So, in a sense, the reality of every level of being is always shaped by its constant turning back towards its superior. Uh, this turning back is, is, is a concept which we are going to revisit again. You know, like I said, the, the, in, in the, the first process which comes is the giving rise to, the giving rise, the giving rise. There's a technical term which Plotinus has used for this idea of a level of being giving rise to another one the term is emanation we are going to talk about the doctrine of emanation as uh, maybe as a as an independent uh, topic in Plotinus so that we exp we, on we understand clearly the process of emanation now the the what i am explaining on principle number three this idea of turning back to its origin each level turning back to its origin is the reverse movement of emanation in emanation a being is being given rise to it generates it is generated rather from another level which pre-existed it but then in this other issue it is the generated in this other level uh, principle it is the generated turning back towards its source of emanation right so in order for every being to to have to keep its reality it's a kind of like for is saying that if it were possible for a being not to turn back to its reality it would cease to be i mean to its source it would cease to be if a being were to exist if any level of being in this hierarchy in this cosmic hierarchy were to adopt that mode of being of not making a reference back to the source that generated it that level which ceases to make that reference back to its source would cease to be that is what Plotinus is, is in a way saying so for Plotinus therefore uh, for any being at any level of being to keep on being to keep on existing to keep on sustaining its being its reality its existence it must always have this constant connection this constant going back towards its uh, source uh, in, uh, he, he uses a language which is more or less it's, it's a, a romanticized kind of language because it, the, the process of going back is not a physical movement like I'm traveling back to my native to, to my native land no it's a kind of contemplation it contemplates its source okay every every level of being has to contemplate its source now I don't know maybe for us humans it's easy to understand how contemplation is but then those other aspects of nature which um, we we humans will consider to be non-rational i don't know how they are how plotinus would explain uh, this contemplation of their source in terms of those beings but for us humans it's possible we do we think of our maker uh, we think of our you know we, we pray to god of course that's turning back to our source 
we always go back to our ancestral roots you know because these are the people who are immediate progeny and all of that so uh, for the non-rational aspects of, of being probably we, we if Plotinus we are still alive or maybe we were able to dig deeper into various interpretations of the Aeneas, we could find an answer to how the non-rational components of the material universe do this return journey to their source of being. And so we can say that in the Neoplatonic, no, Neoplatonic universe, in Plotinus's outlook of the universe, uh, his universe, his his Neoplatonic universe is characterized by uh, a kind of a double movement. One is a, uh, a forward movement, one is a backward movement. One is an outgoing movement, one is a return movement. An outgoing movement and a return movement. Outgoing movement represents the being being given rise to each level of being being generated from its source and uh, the return movement represents this uh, contemplation this contemplative desire each being which was generated always in a sense desires union with its roots always has this tendency of referencing itself to the source that generated it that 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 is these are the two kind of movements you remember that this is not this 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 idea is not really very unique to plotinus you know uh, plato plato we will remember very very well plato has spoken about the the downward and the upward dialectic the downward and the upward dialect, dialectic. If you if you remember Plato's concept, uh, what we call the metaphor of the divided line in Plato, there is a descending dialectic, and then there is an upward dialectic. The descending dialectic represents the movement from the world of forms to the world of the senses. Now the ascending dialectic now re re represents. Um, the movement from the world of the senses back to the world uh, to the world of forms so although there is a dichotomy between the different different the two worlds in plato this dichotomy does not mean that they are the two worlds are mutually exclusive they do interact it is possible to make a rational journey a contemplative journey from the world of the senses into the world of forms plato made that possible and this is a kind of same idea that uh, plotinus is bringing to us uh, today plotinus is making us understand that from the from the archetypal source of all reality that is the the, the mother source of being there is this downward movement until we reach the the meanest or the least uh, parts of reality those ones which are shrouded in darkness because of their uh, you know their, their diminution in real in terms of reality which in plotinus is the world of matter and then there is also the the upward movement which is which, which, which is what i'm referring to here as the the return movement the backward movement the return movement is things seeking you know they are uh, there are a certain a certain union if we want to put it that way in quotes a certain union the union here would definitely not be physical it, it would be more or less cosmic union it would be more or less a mystical kind of union with the sources of their being with the sources of their origin the the, the sources from which they, are, they originated and then of course we have um the next the principle number four which explains to us the concept of the, the, the i mean which explains to us the cos the cosmic worldview of plotinus is the fact that each level of being precisely because it is originated is an image or expression on the lower level 
of the lot of the level above it which also i mean which is its generator i think this principle it's clear from all metaphysics a an effect must resemble its cause so it shouldn't be surprising to us that um uh, we are saying this plato plato held that view aristotle held that view an effect must resemble uh, its cause in some way so according to Plotinus, therefore each level of being is a mirror image is a reflection or an expression but at a lower level of the level that comes above it it reflects the level that comes above it but does so in 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 a, in a less in a less um, ontological manner in a less ontological manner yes just like we are images of god human beings are images of god but definitely i don't think there's any, somebody who is a carbon copy of god here <laughs> among us and in fact the whole human race there is no carbon copy of god so but we do re reflect or resemble god in a you know an imperfect manner yes so we possess in uh, if we want to we, we, i think what plotinus is saying here is um I don't know which metaphysical principle is this again. The one of the three ways. It's one of the three ways. Whether it's a via, um, well, I think we, we we can check that whether it's the via causalitatis or the via eminencia or the via the the via negativa uh, I, I i would think that is the via negativa the via negativa we, we holds that um we can get to know of a of, of of a supreme being we can get to know god because he is of course that that ultimate uh, level of being by denying of him the imperfections in the lower grades of mm. of being so uh, mm. it, it's possible for us to to know god so let's have it at the back of our mind that the, 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 the imaging that we are referring to here, the resemblance is, is not a physical, not a uh, physical resemblance only. It's not at the level of outward appearances. Uh, the outward appearance is even at the least level of uh, imaging that we are referring to here. Uh, lower levels of being image the higher levels that are their progenitors primarily in a more ontological fashion than just mere physical uh, resemblance so this principle of uh, the principle which states that lower levels of being reflect image or express although in an imperfect manner those other higher levels that give rise to them is a theme which runs through all uh, the platonic uh, all, all 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 of uh, neoplatonism in plotinus so it, it, it's it's about the relation of the effect to the cause the if the relation of the archetype to the image the relation or the relation of that which is given rise to to that which gives rise and so on so this principle it, it is very it, it, it's it's a it's a theme which runs through all of metaphysics it's, it's like uh, the the every, what holds things in existence is this relation of the the of the effect to their causes the the relation of the images to their archetypes to their prototypes and things of that nature so let's let, let let's mark that then the, the fifth theme that we could say runs through Neoplatonism is the idea that degrees of being are also degrees of unity. Degrees of being are also degrees of a unity. Unity here we are talking in terms of uh, metaphysical unity, not, not um, social unity. 
you know, social unity. We're talking about ontological unity. Uh, absolute ontological unity is the idea that there is only one being. It's what we refer to as the principle of unicity in, in being. So when we say that uh, degrees of being are also degrees of, un of unity in, uh, in Plotinus, what we are referring to is the fact that the higher up you go in the hierarchy of being, the less the multiplicity of beings at each level of being. And the lower down you go in the hierarchy of being, the ladder of, be of ontological being, the greater the multiplicity in the number of beings at each level of being. That is, uh, that, that, that is the principle that we are referring to here. So degrees of being also imply degrees of unity at the topmost level of being topmost level of being ontologically all metaphysicians will tell us that there, 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 there is no possibility of multiplicity there there is no possible of multiplicity there because it all boils down to one one thing the unity that we are talking about here Take, for example, the Christian concept of uh, the Trinitarian God. The Christians, the Christian, uh, Christian Trinitarian philosophy holds that, you know, in, there, there are three, at the topmost level of being, you know, there are three persons. Now, these three persons do not make up three different gods. They make one God. What is the understanding behind this? The understanding is that Although there is you no know, multiplicity three, there is something which is or which underlies all of them, which is their unique commonality. And their unique commonality is the divinity, the Godhead. There are no two types of Godheads in God. There is only one type of Godhead. I, mean, I don't know if it has the right expression. They, they are, I'm not the, I'm, I'm doing philosophy, so I will not be afraid to to say something which theologians might find offensive because this, this is not theology. So we are just using this as an analogy that within the Godhead, you, you, you do not have different types of divinity. You have, uh, you have three persons. The three persons do not imply uh, multiplicity in divinity there is on there is absolute unity in divinity even though there is multiplicity in in in, in the individual persons that make up that level of being so this is exactly what Plotinus is, is pointing to us degrees of being are also degrees of unity you know for 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 each for the higher levels of being the multiplicity is very very little higher levels of being multiplicity is very very little. and you can see that from from the from the the the, the, the ultimate source of being for plate for 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 neoplatonism neoplatonism and for plotinus in particular is not two even it is one source it's one source and that source is the one for plato it was the good you see for plato it was the good for the ionians even at least even what traces that far back as the ionians will realize that this idea of unicity was already there the ionians also held to the idea that the primary source of everything the primary element from which everything came some of them already had that idea that it must be one it cannot be two you know even though they differed in their understanding of what this one element could be but that fundamental idea that it, that it was it is impossible to have multiplicity in the in, in primary element was already there at the beginning so but when you begin to move down the hierarchy of being uh -huh, you begin to have what unicity begins to disappear and what comes in is multiplicity so higher up the ladder the greater the unit the, the, the unity Lower down the ladder, the less the unity and the greater the multiplicity in the of beings at each level of of being. So I hope this this point is is, is clearer. As you go up the ladder, the hierarchy of being, unicity increases, multiplicity decreases. As you go down the ladder, in the hierarchy of being, 
unicity decreases, multiplicity increases. That is the principle. The sixth issue, uh, principle or the sixth fundamental theme we want to stress in Neoplatonism of Plotinus is the idea about the ultimate principle from which everything derives. If we know, if we go, we take ourselves back into Greek philosophy, we will realize that all cosmological philosophy has this one thing in common. There is always that reference to something from which everything derives. If you if, if you look at with the with the Miletians, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, they made reference to the arche, the origins, the remote origins of everything. You know, it's always that idea, that one element from which everything, and they have their descriptions of it. You know, even though the Miletians tended not to agree, and in fact, the whole Miletian, I mean, the whole Ionian school never had agreed on it, but they had this idea that it exists. Whether it was one or it was many, whether it was this particular one or it was that one, there was the agreement that, you know, the ultimate principle from which everything derives does exist. And so, right down to Plato, we find Plato himself talks about, about, about this idea of, you know, things we are not always, the, the world as we know it came to be. It came to be through a certain agency and for Plato this agency is the good the form of the good is the agency by which everything comes to be so in Plotinus's philosophy is therefore not surprising that we find this same fundamental tenet running through of the ultimate principle for the one ultimate principle for everything that exists in in the physical universe and the universe as, as, as a whole. So according to Plotinus, it does exist, but then what is it like? The ultimate principle, the arche of things exists. The progenitor of being exists. But what is this thing like? How can we conceptualize it? I know that this is going to be a, a topic for greater elaboration maybe in our next class when we'll be talking about the three hypostases because that will be our topic for the next class we'll talk about the three hypostases in 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 plotinus and we are going to dwell lengthily on this uh, on this idea of the conceptualization of that being from which everything uh, originates by and large plato had told us it's it's since the, 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 the ultimate principle from which everything derives is spiritual, it definitely has the properties of the forms. It has eternality, it has spirituality, spirituality not because it prays a lot, it has spirituality because it is not composed of parts, it's simple, it's, it's, it's not material. And then it's simple because it's not composed of parts, you know. And it's intelligible because it can be known, and in fact, it does make itself known. Um, and all of that, it's it 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 it, uh, it possesses uh, immensity in terms of the degree of being it has, and thanks to that also, in uh, it uh, it possesses greater truth and greater uh, certitude in terms of the knowledge that we can have about it. So for Plotinus, let's cut it short. For Plotinus. The ultimate being, the ultimate principle of being is, he calls it, the one. The one. And I think that this name already answers in a certain sense the, the, the what I was saying before this principle about degrees of being going together with degrees of unity. You see, the, the, just the word one tells you that from a layman's point of view, it is one and not two. You know, so the prince, the ultimate principle of everything is one. It's one. It's unicity. Unicity. You know, thanks to unicity, we also have unity. Uh, I think it would, would be good for somebody to make a, a discussion about um, 
the concepts of uni unity and metaphysical uh, unity and unicity as metaphysical relations and maybe tell us the, the distinction between unity and unicity and how they relate how they relate it, it will be a very it will be a beautiful um if somebody can do that maybe we can begin one of our classes by by listening to that and appreciating that input uh, so um for Plotinus, the ultimate being the ultimate principle is the one and how is the one characterized how is the one like first and foremost the one is free of all determinations possible all determinations and all limitations to say that something is free of all determinations means that it does not have a specific identity and and by this we are not saying that it is capable of being everything no we are simply saying that it is way so removed from the world of things we know that we cannot conceptualize it as being of this nature or of that nature or of that particular nature it is beyond nature it is beyond specificity it is beyond you know categorization into types it is not like uh, this thing is this one and this one is this one no it, it, it is just beyond such kind of description so it's free from all determinations because to be determined in nature already means like saint thomas aquinas would say you possess a certain essence thanks to which you are this thing and not that thing no in the in in, in the understanding of the one this does not happen according to plotinus the one does not have this essence by which by virtue of which it is this and it is not this and it cannot be this and we understand why he says that because the one is the genesis of everything and so being the genesis of everything it possesses so to say even in a remote manner every other specific determinations that are possible to to exist and i want to say this this idea also which plotinus is bringing had already been intimated in pre-socratic philosophy by anaximander if we remember anaximander refused to identify any specific element of nature as the primary element and simply insisted that the primary element was nothing like any of the things we know in nature and so he called it the indeterminate boundless the primary element is indeterminate it is boundless it has no limitations it has no boundaries this is the same idea that um uh protinus is bringing to us that the, the, the ultimate principle has no specific determinations it has no boundaries whether the boundaries be physical boundaries or metaphysical boundaries it doesn't it does it, it, it is it is way too way too immense to be conceptualized within these uh, categories of, uh, of of determinations and limitations so the one the the the, the, the term we use to describe the, uh, this property of the one that is this lack of determination and lack of, of of limitation is transcendence the one is utterly transcendent completely transcendent it goes it is beyond determination it is beyond limitation beyond limitation so the one is utterly transcendent in some philosophical systems the the, cor the, the corollary of transcendence is is immanent and i think this is the case with the uh, 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 scholastic philosophy you know God, God is utterly transcendent, but at the same time, he is involved in human affairs, the affairs of the world, so he is also immanent. Plotinus is telling us the one is utterly transcendent. So it is, not, in other words, beyond being. It is the one beyond all being. And thanks to the fact that the one has no limitations, he has no limitations, he cannot be conceptualized in terms of... Um, uh, how do I put it? In terms of what it is not, in terms of what it is and what it is not, we also can say that the one has 
no divisions in itself. The one has no divisions in itself. So divisions in terms, maybe in terms of um, attributes, in terms of, um, how do I put it? In terms of multiplicity, you know, like in the one there are this, this and that, like, you know, it's, it's absolutely the one, the one is the one, you know. Let me not quote our Christian example again. So the, 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 the one has no divisions. It has, uh, it has no attributes. You cannot describe the one. It's neither tall nor short. It's neither fat nor thin. It's neither fair nor dark. It's neither this nor that. The, the one has no attributes. So in effect, again, we go back to uh, an Aximander that the one is the indeterminate raw material beyond which it is beyond description, beyond being, but thanks to it, everything in being acquires their specifications. Acquires their specifications. So the one cannot be described in terms of attributes or qualifications. We cannot even name it. We cannot even name it. To, 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 because actually to name something is to give it an essence but then in terms of the one we are saying that the s if we want to say in quote the essence of the one is to be without an essence so it cannot be named and so from a point of view of language it is difficult to describe what the one is the one cannot be described so when we call it the one, when Plotinus calls it the one, we are using the one there uh, in, in, a, in, in, in acknowledgement of the limitations of human language and human reasoning. The one there is used simply to designate the complete simplicity of that of that end of <laughs> let me not say of that entity too because you say it's an entity means you're already delineating it is of, of that ultimate principle you know it's we, we use the word the one to imply that it's absolute unity and it's abs absolute simplicity it's not composed and it is not comprised of any multiples Of course, Plotinus, although he prefers uh, the appellation, the one, he also, you know, being a student of Plato, admits that the appellation, the good, which his master used, was also appropriate of um, that principle, the ultimate principle from which everything derives. Why should we call the one, uh, this ultimate principle as the one or as the good. Like I say, the one is used to, 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 to refer to the fact that it has no multiplicity in it. It is absolute, absolute unicity. And it is used to describe the fact that it has no composition. So it's absolute simplicity, it's, complicity, it's total simplicity. We also refer to it as the good because it is the source of all perfections source of all perfections every perfection derives from it and also because it is the ultimate goal of return for everything that goes out you know, talk about contemplative desire no everything has that desire because of the good if the good is not there they would, the object of desire would cease to exist and it's and the desire itself and even the object that is desiring and contemplating would cease to be so the good is the good because one it is the source of all perfections and two because it is the ultimate reference towards which every being is returning in quotes understanding that that returning refers to that re, uh, uh, ontological contemplative attitude of, of being that kind of everything wants to mirror it everything wants to kind of re return to its source from which it came so that is the sense in which uh, the one may also be called the good so 
the good is the good because it is the origin of the impulse to contemplate it. It's not only the source of the perfections that the that the beings that originate from it would have, but it is also the source of their desire for it. It's the source of their contemplative desire. It gives them that impulse, not only of going out, but that also that impulse of coming in. So the impulse here in, and this is an important point which I should have clarified from the very beginning, that the outgoing movement and the return movement of things from and towards the one are ontologically constituted phenomena. They are not issues of the will. They are not like I choose to or I do not choose to do. These are things which happen by what we may call metaphysical necessity. And I want to, to stress that the concept of metaphysical necessity underlies Neoplatonian Neo cosmology. Everything happens not by choice, not by will, but by a certain metaphysical or ontological necessity. And it is the, 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 uh, 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 an evidence of this ontological necessity is this outward movement from the one and the return movement of our ever being towards the one contemplating uh, the, 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 the one. So all of these are questions of metaphysical necessity. I, 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 I want to emphasize again that metaphysical necessity occurs in, in this way, you know, when we are ontologically constituted to operate according to our nature. Uh, I think we remember, we still remember uh, this metaphysical principle um, very well. Uh, quid quid movetur uh, at ab alio movetur, whatever uh, moves, moves towards uh, another thing which is supposed to be its term. And this is what uh, Plot Plotinus is, is addressing here. And uh, it is also the principle that whatever acts, acts according to its mood of being. These are metaphysical, uh, uh, metaphysically constituted issues. So it's not when Plotinus talks about the outward going movement and the return towards the one as a contemplative desire, the desire here should not be understood as emotional. It's not a feeling. It's not like I wish I saw God, like we may sometimes humanly feel, oh, if I could see the Virgin Mary, or oh, if I could see uh, Jesus Christ, or oh, this and that, or oh, the Apostle Philip telling Jesus, let us see the Father. No, that's not it. It is something wired into the DNA of every ontological entity. So metaphysical necessity is that which, which uh, that principle by virtue of which everything functions according to a certain pre-programming. It cannot choose to function otherwise. I think Sartre would refer to that as our facticity. You know, so it, it is the way our nature has been programmed to function. So things are not choosing to turn towards their source. Neither are they choosing to be generated from their source. Sources don't choose to generate things. They generate by, by ontological necessity. And those which are generated seek their source by ontological necessity because that is their nature by responding to the native impulse of their very constitution. Let me leave it here for now. Uh, I know we have had a lot to listen to. Um, I'm sure you are going to have your inputs and your questions, and your contributions as well. It must not always be questions, but probably additions to comment, comments on what I have said that would throw more light on some of the issues that I have raised. Uh, I want to thank you for being there and encourage you. I know it's not easy. Um, some of, I know many of you are into other heavy occupations that to create time like this to to study is not easy so 
I, I, I hope that you will be able to find time in your busy schedule to listen to this and share whatever. The basis of what we are doing here is sharing. We are, we are, we are not into, you know, trying to award somebody. It's, it's true. We want to get our our top up uh, certificates and get our degrees uh, officially from the state. But I think at this level, we we should be understanding that we are not teaching somebody something he has never heard before. We may just be adding flesh to maybe what you heard before, reminding you if, if it has been long since you heard it. So I encourage you to be there to listen to, even if you are not online, when you come online, endeavor to listen to the voices, make comments, um, and then probably also sending your suggestions. If at the end of the day I'm not meeting, I was supposed to have asked this before, let me know also your expectations for the course so that if at the end of the day you feel that your expectations have not been addressed, you can always fall back to me and then tell me, that, okay, you were expecting this to be this issue to be addressed or it has been addressed but not addressed in the way you would have really felt satisfied and we can always uh, revisit it. So thank you, have a blessed day and we look for look forward to our next uh, class i would like to i would like that our next class maybe today is monday we have had a class today um let's have our next class well let me hear your suggestions i think it would be best i also hear your suggestions for when you think we can have a next class or oh, except you prefer that since i'm sending voice messages i can always send them anytime and then uh, we listen to it okay that's fine i can since we are doing the voice message uh, thing i can send them anytime between today and wednesday we're going to i'm going to have another session like this one i'll send more voice notes and then we listen to it and we can we can react uh, like i said if you want to we wish to read ahead of time for the next uh, topic it, it's okay uh and it's, it's very much a, a very recommendable idea. It's, it's a laudable idea. I mean, initiative. Uh, our next uh, subheading we are going to be treating, as I said, is going to be looking at the, uh, the, the whole hierarchy of being in Plotinus. And we are going to begin with the hypostasis, the doctrine of hypostasis in, in, in Plotinus. We are going to talk about the one, uh, the intellect and the soul, and then the process by which you know, the intellect and the soul derive from the one which is the process of, of emanation. So we'll talk about emanationism as, as well in those three. Then we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Then in our next class, we'll touch, about, we'll touch on the, the subsequent uh, products of emanation from, the, from, from especially within the context of the material world. And then maybe before the week runs out, uh, well, I, would, I would have known how many of us are there, who is there. Yeah, so before the week runs out, we'll be able to know how many of us are in the course. And then um, we can take our topics and begin to work on it. And then we agree on when we can when we can submit our, our, our findings, our research, our papers for presentations. Or we share, or come together and we share our knowledge so that we can interact and learn from one another and then at the end of it all we shall close uh, have our evaluation and we close the course so once again i wish you all a blessed day thank you for being there